So, this is the Ace Podcast, where we talk all things art, culture, and entertainment, but most specifically, pop culture, entertainment. I'm your host, Will the Greatest. With me today, I have my co-host, Aaron. Say hello, Aaron. What's up, y'all? Glad to be back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah! Um, hello? Yeah, it's, it's been a minute, but um, how you doing, man? Good, dude. Good, good, good. Been working a lot, um, both for labor and and financial stability and on creative projects, which has been really nice. Um, yeah, doing my poetry thing, doing my acting thing. Um, been been contemplating getting back into TikTok, so my my social media hiatus may come to an end soon. Uh, to be continued on that front, but yeah, overall doing good, man. How about you? How you doing? Oh, uh, I'm. Yeah, I'm doing well myself. You know, work is steady. I might actually start trying to pick up more hours. I'm kind of in a similar boat, trying to get my um creative juices uh flowing, a little bit of writing, working on uh some cosplay stuff. I had to go out and actually get more materials today, so that's always a pretty penny. But um, yeah, things are things are pretty steady. Just getting ready for the summertime. We got at a wedding next me uh, next week. Then July is just going to be jam packed full of stuff. I know um, we'll both be at Blurred, and then yeah. I got a wedding, and then another con. We'll probably run into uh, our buddy Cole. So a lot of things coming down the pipeline, and just trying to make sure I have the money to afford it. Because damn, <laughs> gas prices are no joke. For real, especially out here in Cali, it was like oh god, yeah, five, six dollars right now. Bro, seven, y'all seven, in hell. Yeah, no, it's rough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm over here like, damn, I'm gonna have to get an electric car because this shit is not it. <laughs> you guys even got you got charging stations out there? Yeah, yeah, we got we got charging stations out here at uh, certain places. I mean, they're not terribly hard to find. They're not like everywhere, everywhere, but they're not terribly hard to find. You can find them in in some spots. So okay, yeah, to you, be right. more normal. Yeah, you can be all right. You figured out, but um, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, there's not a lot of order to the okay. Um, I we can do that last. We'll do that last. But uh, do we want to talk about trailers first or news first? Because we just got some news that is rather alarming. Uh, yeah, we'll get the news first. Okay. Um, so you want to start with the the crazy news? Or the the regular news. Let's just hit him with it off the top. You know. All right. So, so um, if anyone doesn't know, Ezra Miller pronouns they them got accused of grooming a minor with LSD, alcohol, and lavish gifts in new court filing, according to Entertainment Weekly. Uh, Takata Iron Eyes has denied their parents' allegations against Miller. Uh, yeah. So Ezra Miller, the um, the terror of Hawaii, as they're known. According to a new complaint, the actor is being accused of grooming a minor from the age of 12. Takata Iron Eyes, now 18, has since denied the claims in a statement on social media. Uh, attorney and activist Chase Iron Eyes and his wife, Sarah Jumping Eagle, I- I'm guessing these are all indigenous people, yeah, filed court documents in Standing Rock CU Tribe Court alleging that Miller has been physically and emotionally abusing as well as psychologically manipulating, physically intimidating, and endangering the safety and welfare of their daughter, Takata Iron Eyes. The court court documents obtained by EW, she, they pronouns, although her parents claim Miller, quote, has decided that Takata is to be called they. Okay. Um, parents alleged that Miller and Takata met during 2016, 2016 standing rock reservation protests in North Dakota when she was 12 and Miller was 23. God damn. Um, uh, they say Miller, who goes by they, them pronouns, has been grooming Takata ever since. So 2016. Yeah. So it's been six years. Um, Miller came to the Rock Reservation in 2016 and established contact under the pretense of assisting the Standing Rock CU tribe during the No Dapple movement. Some shit that still got passed. And I was, God damn. Um, just a, a series of sad events. Ezra Miller took an immediate and apparently innocent liking to Takata Iron Eyes, began to formulate relations with Takata. Ezra flew Takata Iron Eyes and other Standing Rock tribal members to London and the UK for the Fantastic Beasts uh, studio. Where, you know, as was a character in December 2017, Miller allegedly attempted to sleep in the same bed. Oh, no, not attempted. Where Miller uh, attempted to sleep in the same bed as Takata Iron Eyes, who was 14. The documents allege, adding that Miller was ultimately prevented from sleeping in the same bed with.
to cut it the same time by keys or any other item items for detoxifying at home Ooh, to really be into taking people's wallets Yeah, this, and, oh, that doesn't even like the worst part. Yeah, this individual yeah. just does not seem like they are in a healthy state of mind with all. Like the violence. Yeah, that, that incident, the one we're talking about right now. It's been going on. Really gross. So um, yeah. apparently a little bit They're more in article. Yeah. yeah. Um, Straight up. And I think Warner Brothers needs to do something about it. And th this you know, hot, yeah, this hot off the heels, especially with the Johnny Depp, Amber Heard uh, legal debacle that we didn't really get into. The, I think the last time we had a show, but it was, I'm pretty sure it was ongoing the last time it recorded. Um, and I think Johnny Depp won two of the three in regard to that defamation trial. Two of the, two of the three, uh, I guess, charges. Um yeah, EC already is having a lot of shakeups, but two of their like lead supporting characters, one of them who has a movie coming out next year. Who boy, um, like it, you know, so far these are all allegations because I think we do, yeah, we do have a statement from uh, Hada herself themselves. Um, you know, Takata made a statement on Instagram on Monday with the caption context. Uh, addressing assumptions made on my behalf by my family and friends regarding my stability and otherwise. So they said, I dropped out of Bard five months ago. My friend and comrade William passed shortly thereafter. My mind was incredibly impacted and I've needed space and time for the processing of grief. My comrade Ezra Miller for the entirety of the aforementioned era has only provided loving support and invaluable protection throughout the period of loss. I am in no way or under any circumstance have ever been during my short lived adulthood in need of conservatorship. My father and his allegations hold no weight and are frankly transphobic and based in the notion that I am somehow incapable of coherent thought or opposing opinions to those of my own kindred worrying about my well-being. I am now aware of the severity of emotional and psychological manipulation I was made to endure while in my parents' home. Um, and they have a picture of the IG statement. Uh, their statement continues, I'm an adult and I deserve to feel authority in my own body adding that they are excited to speak with a therapist about their own, their quote, anxiety and probable depression it is no one's business. My choices are my own. Still, the parents are asking the court to intervene and issue an order of protection against Miller. A hearing is set for next month. So, um, so I, there's not enough to go, go off of. I mean, obviously, you know, taking this seriously, it's like, if this, if these allegations are true, you know, that's, really disgusting and, and Ezra has already kind of proven themselves to not be a really likable person in, in recent with their series, serious strings of like theft and uh, I believe there's some theft in there, but mostly like abuse and, and violence. So that's already uh, not been, um, not been great. And then, yeah. And, but yeah. in this, this is this might actually make them kind of irredeemable if it's if the, it does come out that there's some evidence that can kind of substantiate this um i am curious about because like you know if if you've been groomed sometimes you don't realize it so and they're they're a young adult you know they're 18 now so you, you're kind of getting into a whole thing of just like not only a little bit of hearsay but a little bit of perception and I think there is a discussion to be had given they use she, they pronouns. So, and, and Ezra being non-binary and also using they, them pronouns is like, yeah, you, the, I think there could be an argument about the intersection of like, you know, if, if a non-binary person is around your child, there can be a little bit of trans panic 
I can't speak on behalf of that community. It's a lot of confusing shit all coming at the same time, but given Ezra's past actions, I don't think they are really shining a positive light on them given these new allegations, you know? So it's like, it, it doesn't look really favorable. I'm not swinging one way or the other opinion wise. I'd like to wait to hear more. Um, but like, given all like had all that recent shit not been going on for the past like year or so i think some people might be a little bit more lenient but given everything that's happened yes it's not looking favorable towards them yeah there's a there's a few angles to look at this from there's the angle of ezra miller as a person and Mm -hmm. the the effect he's had both on the people within this story and his to him in general as um as of late and as things have been coming out uh and there's a the area of looking at it from what does Warner brothers do with uh with his involvement yeah. in the studio and it, and it, and the reason me as you're as you're reading that their article what'd you say their involvement <laughs> their involvement yeah and as you're reading that article uh, it made me think about the ethics of business and is is there room for integrity in business is there do you, do you do do it because you think it's right or do you do it because it's profitable or because it's not profitable and and, and really I mean, hearing, hearing that side and her hearing the article and hearing what the parents say versus what she says happened. And they're both claiming abuse on both sides or manipulation on both sides. We never know. I right. just, we won't know what the true um, matter of events has been or what it is. But yeah, I yeah. think adding up right. what we've done about Ezra Miller, just from a public perspective, I don't yeah. think it looks good. And I think Warner brothers really has to to do something. And I know because it came out recently that uh, Warner brothers believes that the flash is their most, um, it's one of the best movies they've ever made on the DC front. And that's what Warner Brothers believes. And, you know, it kind of puts them in, I guess, a tricky position because uh, what do you do? Do you reshoot the best movie you feel like you've ever made because your star is is being a horrible person by all accounts? By by what mm-hmm. we've seen from just the articles and headlines, we, we don't really have... I mean, we we have it's a like restaurant at this point. You know, it's it's pretty bad. Life. It's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. From what we what we're seeing by like tran- transcripts of events, you know, we don't we. I don't know. It's weird hearing like someone's perspective who is a manipulator because uh, you know people who typically do that always view themselves as the victims. So it's kind of hard to to rely on them as someone who's a um a truthful perspective. So hearing all of this, it kind of makes me wonder what's going to happen. You know, I don't know. Like, it's really shitty because I, I used to really like Ezra Miller as an actor. And I thought that they were they're a really promising talent. But it goes back to that thing. Like, can you separate an artist from their art? And yeah. I don't know. It's going to be hard, like watching watching him in movies or watching them in movies yeah. or whatever content they do, knowing the kind of person that they are like. Then again, it also is like, I don't know, I feel like famous people have just a different kind of anonymity when it comes to mm-hmm. their power or, or, or their relationship with responsibility and how the, how the, the public treats them. Because like, fuck, even serial killers, which is like way worse than what Ezra, obviously what Ezra Miller has been doing is awful. It's terrible. Yeah. But, but then there's but murders. <laughs> have a fan base, you know, they get fan mail because their crimes made them famous in some degree. But even like something like this, who's actually famous for his work, not something he's done um, publicly, that's that's horrendous. I think that even though we feel in this moment that it's not a good look and that it's not something that should uh, go on, I don't know. And honestly, how much it will affect his career, their career, because, like, like I said, like they made this movie and they're they wanted all this freaking money because you know they made the Flash. We have Michael Keaton back. 
Like we can't scrap this movie. We got we got the Batman, you know. So you basically can't reshoot it. But I think what makes it especially tricky is Warner Brothers would kind of be hypocrites if they didn't do anything. Um, but Aquaman two is is still mid. Uh, I think they're mid post production. So I because I think that comes out this year, doesn't it, or does it come out next year? It's soon. It's it might be next year because well, I know the Flash comes out. Yeah, so it so the Flash and Aquaman two both come out next year, so they're both mid uh post production. Two of their biggest stars just got in trouble, and why I say they'd be hypocritical is um remember we were at Hall H a couple years back for the second Fantastic Beast movie where Johnny Depp was there, and this was around this is around the time they initially got divorced. But then remember Johnny got fired over his allegations of abuse. Um, which turned out to be a lot more complicated as like the case went on and he got replaced. So if they fired well, one actor for it, for from the, um, you know, just bad press and the allegation and everything. Cause it, I think it was before they started filming. I think that's also the yeah, difference. Is. That's what the loophole is. Like he, they did it before yeah. he even, they even started filming. Like, well, Amber yeah, these movies are already shot before the third one. So, right. But so, it's, it doesn't help yeah, that the movies them. aren't out. <laughs> if they replaced her, if they fired her mid shoot, she can sue them as like because yeah, because of, cause of, cause of the contractual obligations. Um, and and Ezra no, might be able to do the same, same too. But if if this new Flash movie is supposed to be like a turning linchpin of the DC, I mean, honestly, your best bet might just be post credit scene new Flash as Grant Gustin or. I was credited no. seeing new Flash as Wally West. Like, either bringing in Grant as a new alternate Barry, since you're basically supposed, I think, allegedly, potential spoiler, I guess, um, allegedly they're supposed to be re- soft rebooting everything, with, like Keaton is the new Batman, but, like, Affleck, Batfleck is in his own pocket universe, and a bunch of a bunch of weird things, uh, uh, allegedly, according to, to some screeners. But, um. Yeah, the the only thing I can think of is you gotta probably do a new flash going forward. Yeah, just, this, need, this is a this is a pretty damning it. one. And it is like yeah. if if it comes up and it's not true, like there's and it and it's like somehow they have a way to clear the air from this one, you still have like four other arrests. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So so you're already not really a likable person to be in like a social context you know this is just the one that would probably definitely knock you over is grooming and and potentially like sexual harassment and sexual abuse like why do i have the feeling like him and max landis are friends <laughs> they get along really well <laughs> oh shit I don't, I don't have a witty retort for that um i think because they both they both have probably similar personalities i think that's what it is um, I get that vibe. I definitely get that vibe. Because, because like Max, Max is so complicated to me. Is like because I love Max as a creative, but Max did do some really shitty stuff, and it and like owned like at least Max had the decency to own up to their shit to his shittiness. But some of it's not all. Music. Own up to some of the shit. Yeah, like I think he owned up to the emotional and mental like toxicity in his relationships. At least I recall because he had he had like a whole medium article talking about it and how people have like still been harassing him for it, which I mean, you know, if true, I you know hey, look, it's the internet. You sometimes you just gotta eat that shit. It's it is what it is. I can't say what's right or wrong, but I mean, yeah. So I, I can de- yeah, I can definitely see the same image as you. It's like, yeah, they could I think Max during his collider years probably would have been friends with Ezra. Um, whether or not they are now is I don't know, but yeah, yeah. I, I think that's all for for that bit of uh, thoughts. So we can go on to some of the other bits of news. Um, we got some news today. We're getting a Thunderbolts movie. They tapped. Um, yeah. Weird. Yeah, they, yeah. So remember a couple years back when uh, we had like three Marvel slots for movies that were complete mysteries. I'm assuming this is filling one of the slots. We also got news that Blade is supposed to start uh, production July 4th, uh, Independence Day. Oh, 
Oh, coming up. We yeah, heard no so casting news, have we? Not much casting. Uh, I can't, I can't recall like be one person, but um. Okay, so uh, Jake Schreier has been tapped as the director for Thunderbolts. Um, and then Black Widow scribe Eric Pearson will be doing the script. Um, Interesting. Have you seen, uh, did you watch that movie Old? No, I heard terrible things about it, which is sad because I wanted to see it. It's but. fun. It's a, I mean, it's a, it's a trip of a movie. Is that about uh, the yeah, Shyamalan movie? movie? Yeah, the Shyamalan movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, they cast uh, one of the, the guys from that movie. His name was Aaron Pierre. He's uh, the one blocked with the movie. Mm-hmm. And then um, Delroy. Delroy Lindo? Lindo? Yeah. Oh, no, he's, yeah, he's a great actor. Yeah, he's a great actor. Yeah. Um, so Jake, Jake Schreier, he's done uh, Paper Towns, which I did see that. I actually quite liked that one. Did I see Paper Towns? Yeah, I did. I did. Ooh, the director does not have a promising track record, so I'm a little concerned about that. Um, I did see Paper... Yeah, I liked Paper Towns. I saw Paper Towns on a date. I'm, like, trying to remember his fucking movies. Um, Chance the Rapper's Magnificent Coloring World, which came out... Like, and Robot and Frank. And he's done a lot of music videos for Francis and the Lights, uh, Kanye West... Selena Gomez, Chance the Rapper, Alzi, Benny Blanco, Selena Gomez, Kashmir Cal, a lot of Kanye, um, Haim, Justin Bieber, Baby Keem. And he's done a couple episodes of TV. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is very quizzical. Um, we don't really know much about it. We're assuming that the roster is probably going to be Zemo, Yelena, Ghost, Taskmaster, Abomination, US A- and uh, US Agent, maybe Winter Soldier. Is Ghost, is, is Ghost still a villain by the end of the Ant-Man and the Wasp? No, no, she was. She they saved her. Um, but I, I hold to this day that Ant-Man and the Wasp is, is such a dumb movie because everything could have been resolved by her saying please, just waiting like an hour. <laughs> right. I'm going to die in the next... And it's like, by tomorrow. Well, just give us an hour to save her and we'll come back and fix you. Right. She, she was fixed by the end of it. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. Yep. No, yeah, people want to use their words. Uh, yeah, Game and Wasp, not my favorite movie. But, no, no, yeah, it, it, it's probably one of the dumbest premises, but it's it's harmless. Um, yeah, this this directing writing duo. Eh, I don't know what's going on at Marvel, and and this kind of leads us into our next topic, so we can talk about both of them together. Um, so Daredevil is ret- the monkey's paw curled, and we are getting a new Daredevil series for Disney Plus. Uh, however, uh, it will be led by Matt Corman and Chris Ord, who created the spy thriller Covert Affairs. They will write and executive produce a new series, and their track record is very not good. It is very inconsistent. It has me very concerned. Um, let's yeah, see. I saw that too. Not, uh... Yeah, not, uh, not looking forward to it. <laughs> but I'm not... I'm I'm not against it but i'm not excited i need to see i I am incredibly nervous especially because like a report came out uh this one's from comicbook.com so it's like the reboot could take a lighter tone from the netflix series which eh. so this is according to uh sana amanat who's uh one of the co-creators as well as producers of miss marvel which we'll get to in a little uh probably after this um Let's see. A former comics editor that oversaw one of the highest rated Daredevil comic runs. Disney Plus has no reason not to adapt a lighter tone with the series. I don't see why not. Mark Wade's run was pretty seminal. Uh, she said in an interview with Murphy's Multiverse, we've never seen that kind of story and I love the spin on that and it was such an unexpected take on the character in the same way. I wouldn't be surprised if they did something like that in the MCU. Why not? We like to take risks and this is the fun part of exploring multiple stories, so maybe. Um, so I'm... Yeah. I want more Daredevil, but I am I I'm I'm really really cautious with this team. Um, 
as let, let's talk. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I really liked what they've been doing thus far, or Marvel's teams, or how they've been handling the Netflix characters. I mean, granted, I liked. It's not yeah, he, fair. He did not Deck his. the Halls, The Enemy Within, The Brave, Covert Affairs. Um, yeah, it's not. It's not fair to to really critique or even have uh, any sort of strong opinion about Charlie Cox in No Way Home. But what the fuck was that in Ho- in Hawkeye with Kingpin? I was I, like, oh. The and the thing is, like, the acting is the actors are fine. I'm not worried about them. Um, it's your writing, and that's yeah. That. It's I the think writing we were, yeah, we were talking earlier about a uh, uh, Kenobi, which we'll, we'll probably do that once that wraps. Um, to kind of succinct our thoughts, we I think we both agree there's something going on with the writing on that show. I think directing wise, I think it's fine. I think performance wise. You can't. This is the thing. You can't outperform a script. It just can't. You. It's. It's the facts of life. We're both actors. We both know this. You know. Mm-hmm. If the script don't work, it can only do so much with the delivery. Um, Star Wars historically doesn't have great like dialogue. Um, Marvel shows. The the performances I think have carried. A little bit of their story beats, but it's into a point where Kevin, I know you like getting experimental and creative uh with like who you decide to run these ships, but I don't know like we'll see, you know, for both of these projects, we'll certainly see. I'm gonna remain cautiously optimistic and hope it's good, fingers crossed, but yeah, I I would prefer Daredevil, like, it doesn't have to be TVMA to be serious. Like we were talking about with, with Kenobi. You can take a concept serious um, and and have it still be like TV-14. Kenobi's TV-14. I think Mando's TV-14. Mm-hmm. And, and Mando is pretty, can be pretty intense at moments. The dude got bisected by a door in the first episode. Like in Multiverse of Madness, like, she gets bisected with a shield. You know, Captain Carter yep. did. Rest in peace. Um, so it's like, you can do stuff like that without it being like law and order SVU, you know, it's like, yeah, right. I can hear the rapists in the street at night, holding down the children. Oh, like like it doesn't kiddie. have to be that for you to take it seriously. Right. No, I don't think it's going to be super kitty or anything. I, I think it's going to be lighter. I don't know. If, Cause like we think lighter, we're thinking they're going to put him in like, like Hawkeye and actually like give him one lighters and stuff. And I don't even think that's necessarily the case. I feel like, We've seen enough of the MCU to know that there's variety and in, in nuance enough to know that they're not gonna we they're riding on the familiarity of the of us knowing this Daredevil. I don't think they're gonna do a complete 180. Yeah. And say why people like those characters in the first place. Even though they were towing the line, they were trying to make them more comic accurate with with Hawkeye, with Kingpin. They're, but they're working on it. They're they're you working know, on it. In a way. Um, and you know, I don't know how with so many different properties that Marvel's working on, Kevin, Kevin Feige is one man. I don't know how involved he is directly with with this movie because, like, yeah, he's the what the chief creative officer, but how many he's he also, actually? He's also an ex- executive producer on all these, but I think he also has his own little. He probably has his own little team. Um. Of like, yeah, no, like uh, only he well. was hands on with uh, with Black Panther because like what Nate, what's that? What's that? Nate, uh, name? what's his name? Not Miller, not Parker. God, I know who you're t- Nate Moore. That's his name. Nate Moore, yeah. So like he's been more hands on with with certain projects because he has to come back. He's one man. He has to defer the responsibility out to all these other people. So. I trust Kevin Feige. Maybe I don't super trust all the people he has underneath him. So it's only only time will tell the quality of what Daredevil will be. Right. Just yeah, gotta so, wait and- yeah, like like f- fingers crossed, you know, this is a W uh for them. I, I am curious with uh, did you see Princess Week's video about Electra? I started it, I didn't finish it. I gotta go back um, for it. I, I think it I think it's Quite good. She makes some pretty good points about like the characterization of her, um, and and how she's been adapted. So I'm curious about if this show is going to be a soft continuation or a soft reboot because it does like season three of the Netflix series does kind of end on a cliffhanger, and now that it's on Disney Plus, you can watch it. So 
but uh, I'm I don't know. I, I I want it to be good. I hope it's good. Um, but yeah. Uh, well, do we want to move on to trailers? Let's get it. Well, well, what trailers came out in the time since we last recorded? Uh, I believe we had quite a few trailers. Like I didn't, I didn't get a chance to talk about the Miss Marvel trailer, so I'll give my thoughts before we get into that. Um, but uh, we have Black Adam, and we have the upcoming Predator movie, Prey. Um, so Black Adam came out today. I think Prey came out yesterday. Um, did you see the Black Adam trailer? You want to start with that? Yeah, I did. I did watch the Black Adam trailer. It looks cool. You know, yeah. it looks. Yeah, it looks fun. Cool. I don't know. I don't really have any strong emotions about it, one way or the other. Maybe I don't. I don't have a, a huge attachment to Black Adam. I think the thing for me it. is that I don't know, man. I feel like I think this will, this will be a hurdle I personally have to get past. But mm-hmm. I just see the Rock. I just see Dwayne Johnson in like a, a spandex. That's seat. fair. That's fair. <laughs> Uh, that, that's that's yeah i think that i mean even when because i've i've only seen um i've read i think i've read the rebirth run of, of shazam i need to actually catch up because it was a dc book that i quite enjoyed because they were actually going into the the shazam elite was going into the realms and you actually meet uh billy batson's birth father um so mm-hmm. it had a really interesting narrative but i i kind of fell off i need to get back into it so i didn't see a lot of a uh, black adam in terms of appearances so my understanding of him is extremely limited but I got into it from the Shazam movie, but yeah, I agree with you. It looks entertaining. Um, yeah, my understanding of Black Adam is he's this very sophisticated, like ruler conqueror type guy, kind of like a kind of like a, a Doctor Doomish type of fella. Not exactly, but you know, kind of that cadence of superiority, especially since he was the first uh, champion of the Wizard Shazam. So Mm kind of want to see the rock maybe lean into, I'm sure he's done his research. He's been holding on to this role for God, what? 10 years. I think this this project has been in, has been in development. Um, and he was cast at it back when he did like race to witch mountain. That's how long it's been. Remember that? Yeah. Oh my God. He's been attached to the, cause he was in the running for this and Shazam. And I think he picked black Adam because he looks like him aside from you know the ears and his hair if he had his old hair and had pointy ears he'd look like him <laughs> yeah i was gonna say because they could have given this man a wig or something like <laughs> yeah, but, but we're also not used to seeing we haven't seen the rock with hair in a while but i mean he'd be fine with it he could pull it off uh with the right person but as long as it's not as long as it's not tyler perry's hair and makeup team gosh. i think we should be fine i don't don't wish that threat upon this man this black king, because I mean he is black, so. But um, yeah, I mean it just it looks entertaining. Um, I really have much to say. Like we we got our first images of the rest of the Justice Society, so we all get to see what they look like. They all look good. Um, yeah, I have very very little <laughs> attachment to any of these characters. The most familiar ones I know are like Doctor Fate and uh, Hawkman. Um, I think that. Like the costumes look good. Uh, I don't know. It, it looks like a fun movie. Um, I, I think I just hope they actually play him fully as an anti-hero. And, yeah. they, and you know, when they inevitably have him, a lot of people are wanting him to fight Superman. I'm like, fuck that. I want to see him fight Shazam. Cause, right. I, Cause him and Superman have a bit of a history of like him. There's an infamous uh, animated short. I think it's called Superman and Shazam fight versus black Adam. Mm. So I think people really want that, and he's kind of notorious for like throwing blows with Superman, who one of his weaknesses is magic. So he's right. one of the people that could actually fuck him up. Um, I'm like, nah, bro. I want to see him fight Shazam. Like, you know, the two, the two, the old uh, Herald of the Wizard and the new one. I, I want that. Like, yeah, eh, we get a Superman eventually. I don't, I don't really give a shit. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not that attached to him. Um, I mean, it, it looks fun. I'm, I'll I'll definitely go see it. Yeah, no, I'll see it. Like, I'm not super excited, but I'll I'll check it out, of course. Yeah. Um, and the prey trailer. Uh, it looks fun. I think it looks really cool. The fact that it's taking place kind of 
in a time long ago with indigenous people. I think it's a very interesting take that I hadn't thought of, but I'm happy to see it. I think it makes the threat more dire because there is a lack of technology. And I'm curious to see how these people overcome such a futuristic alien. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And this is this is something I've been begging for for a while. I'm just like, just do a period piece, the alien versus the predators. That was always my bit. I'm like, do Native Americans versus the predator or do like there's a, a YouTube short film that was uh, the predator versus medieval knights, which was a really cool concept. Ooh. Like the easiest way to do this franchise is just taking these two characters and throwing them in different environments. It's easy money. And God bless Dan Trachtenberg, who is a a good director I, I i like him um he did a great job with 10 cloverfield lane but uh, i'm excited for this one um the direction looks good uh, apparently they, they cast actual indigenous people there's going to be a dubbed version in english and then one in the i can't remember which language it was but the native language that it was actually uh that the the that that tribe is is from so they'll have it uh both dubbed and and subbed which i think is Pretty cool. Um, so wait, did they shoot it in that native language and then dub it for English, or they shot it two different ways? I think they shot it in the native language and dubbed it with English. Oh, cool. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, so... Oh, so this is his second movie. Wow. Oh, it, wow. oh God. This one was great, so... And Holy shit. The way they shot from the, this one looks really cool. Like, the shot, the whole thing with the bear, and then utilizing her her helplessness against the threat of the bear to show how nothing yeah. it was with the predator and how it revealed the predator to her. I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was a very inspired yeah. shot. I, yeah, I really like that. How like you see the bear chasing after her and she's hiding away and I mean, you, you kind of consent. You're like, Oh, that bear is about to get fucked up and you see the bear get fucked up, but you don't see what's doing it. Yeah. Okay. Like, it's just, it's, it's I don't know. It's quick. Like, yeah. Taking and, out easy. And it was a point that you made uh, before we we had started recording too. Like, um, you have to basically really, if you're in a time period with a lot more uh, primitive weaponry, you basically have to figure out how do you outsmart the predator. So I think I hope they do kind of lean a lot into the title uh, of them being the prey here. You know, they're the ones being uh, hunted, and it's like how do you outsmart the hunter who has all the resources and tools, and and you're you know completely. Uh, you're completely out of your league. So um, Dan has yeah. a solid track record, oddly enough. He hasn't done a yeah. lot, but he's done. He's done. Uh, Dan Brown's the Lost Symbols. He did an episode of The Boys, I think, from season two. But remember that Black Mirror episode playtest? No. With, um, oh God, who's the guy that plays U.S. Agent? What's his face? His kid. Who played U.S. Agent? Oh, Russell Wyatt? Yeah. Wyatt Russell. Wyatt Russell. Yeah, that was the it was the Black Mirror episode with Wyatt Russell with the video game. Mm, okay. I, that was one of the you episodes mean, that really fucked me up from Black Mirror. That was Dan Tracted Burke. <laughs> oh shoot. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um That was so, a good episode. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was one a, a pretty a pretty strong, uh pretty heartbreaking episode, honestly, but you know what it was about this trailer that really got me? It was the fact that, unlike you and some of our other friends, I know you guys kind of grew up with Predator and like have an, an affinity for that franchise. But I think I've I've seen three of them. I've seen three of the Predators. I haven't seen the, EV, the AVP movies. But even just watching this trailer, and the trailer doesn't tell you until it appears that it's a, a Predator movie. I was already, I was just intrigued in watching this indigenous girl, like, and the activities that she was doing prior to finding out that it was a Predator movie, which I think is a sign of, of something good, because the character in the story take precedent over the, uh, the franchise itself, which kind of something that attracted me, because I feel like this is something that is going to please both old school fans of Predator, but also going to bring in new people that wanted to see an engaging story. I I wholeheartedly agree because I think it's one of the same strengths that 10 Cloverfield Lane has where essentially you don't know that it's part of a franchise until, you know, because it's focused on telling a narrative. 
a 10 cloverfield lane lane was definitely about mystery and uh isolation and like trying to tell oh what's real who's telling the truth and shit like that and then you get to the part with like the aliens and shit and same thing for like exactly what you were talking about you know it seems like okay we have you know this these native people in their tribe just trying to live their life and survive day to day and then you add in this extra element of like oh yeah space hunters by the way so how do you deal with that so it's like a day in the life taken to an extreme which i think that's a really interesting premise like a day in the life for this community um yeah so hopefully this one is good and it does well so that we can have them do one in africa next because that's i want to see that y'all don't y'all don't fuck around with like African tribal history enough, and you you need to del- delve into mm-hmm. that pantheon. Right. That's such an untapped market. Yeah, yeah. No, that would be I'll be super down for that one. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm excited, and it's going to be on Hulu, so it's going to be pretty accessible too. Um, oh hell yeah, yeah. The uh, the Comanche Nation in 1719. Okay. Mm. Oh, dude, that, wait, so, sorry, uh, before we go on to, to Miss Marvel, the lead actress playing Naru, um, she has, like, the dopest fucking name, Amber Mid-Thunder. Mid-Thunder? Her last name is Mid-Thunder. Ooh, that's awesome. Wow, she's, she's young, but she has a yeah, impressive a track record. Name. She's, she's 25, but she has a track record dating all the back, all the way back to 2001. Wow. Um, okay, she's been in this. Cool. I'm happy, yeah, so I'm happy yeah. she's finally getting her, her due. Yeah, this seems like it might be a big break for her, so good good for her. Um, she, she does some uh, TV work, too. She did that Roswell show. Uh, she's still in that Roswell show. <laughs> oh, she was in, she oh, was in wow. Legion! Oh! No. Cool. Good for her. That's dope. I'll, I'll, I'll watch that soon. Um, all right. Let's talk about Ms. Marvel. Uh, episode one dropped. You know, you usually like to talk about shows that we've done, but this is a special case because this is my girl Kamala Khan. Um, I'll say this: I told y'all when the first trailer dropped, I honestly wasn't really feeling it. <laughs> I'm gonna keep it. A, I'm gonna keep it a stack. wasn't Wasn't really feeling it too much. Um, not because the casting or anything. It's just like I don't know. It seemed like they're maybe trying to force it a little too much. But having actually watched the show, now we finally get to discuss it more um for me as a kamala fan who's been reading her books pretty much since she debuted i actually don't remember i might have her number one somewhere um i've missed like one run of hers that i need to go back and finish but i think it's really really good i think it's actually really really strong um i think acting is on point um, Aman Vellani is a show stealer as uh, Kamala. Um, I think in terms of adapting the character herself, they excel very, very well at, at doing that. And like even the ways they kind of remix her origin story, I think are overall really creative. I think the family is interesting and dynamic and relatively in line with what they're like uh, uh, in the comics. Um, the the background visual effects that kind of manifest what I can only describe as Kamala's rampant ADHD um, is absolutely beautiful. There's a lot of money put into this production budget that kind of caught me off guard, but it makes me happy. I mean, I think they really want her to be something, especially because she's going to be a, a big forerunner in the upcoming The Marvels movie. Um, so I think, you know, production's good, acting's good, writing's good. Uh, is there anything I didn't like? <laughs> and well, <laughs> as well, you know, uh, I am not now. And I explain myself out. I'll, I'll give it here for, for those that listen. Um, I'm not. And I, I haven't really been a fan of the take of apparently they call it hard light in, in the upcoming episode. But it's like the the hard light manifestation of Kamala's powers and what it may imply now I'm hoping they don't go this direction, but the reason I enjoy the Ambigan power more so is because 
and this show does introduce this as definitely part of the narrative of like who who are you going to be what does it mean to be you you know who are you kamala so a big thing with like her one of her initial arcs and how she gets her powers is basically her learning to be able to accept herself and not desire to be others just because it's deemed like quote unquote acceptable um and so with her shape shifting it's a lot more of a literal way to to lean into that and i think you kind of actually make it a little bit more difficult by changing the powers to what everyone is believing to be the quantum bands now we don't know we still have five more episodes left um i think it can potentially take it away because as far as we know essentially you're ascribing her powers to a physical item uh, and I, I, that is a really stark contrast. It's like if Peter Parker's powers are all tied to his web shooters. So it's like, oh yeah, you put those on in your Spider Man, and, and you know, so inevitably, what the general through line is, oh, okay, you've you've basically made their powers tied to a MacGuffin. At one point, they lose the MacGuffin, but it's like, hey, it's okay. You're marvelous without your powers. Grown cornball. We've all done it. They did it in fucking Multiverse of Madness. They did it in Moon Knight, which we'll maybe talk about later. But um, and, and that one bothered me too. But like, I don't want them to go down that path of someone else telling her, "Hey, you're good just how you are." I want her to still be able to find that within herself, uh, which is actually a little bit what they did with Homecoming. That is something else that I also like about this. This very much has like a homecoming tone and style to it, which I think fits perfectly, but it also updates it. You know, her classmates are obviously diverse. She has this hilarious uh, gay school counselor who quotes Mulan. I quite enjoyed him. Um, so I just, th th those are just kind of my, my initial thoughts. I, I still overall really, really like it, but that is something that like, I need to see how they're going to, what they're going to do with that part of the narrative and why, and if they provide a justification for changing it, because I already know that the inhumans exist because black bolt was in multiverse of madness and Marvel has made it very clear about that. I'm just like, why not use her as the, like they were in production around the same time. So to, she was filming next to a uh, Loki and no way home. When she was filming. She came out and said that that's how she met the Toms. It's like, dude, just you know, fucking just, you could have made it in humans and you could have had that be an introduction. Our powers are too close to Mr. Fantastic. It's like, okay, but who cares? Like, oh no. Marvel. You know, it's just, I'm like, I, I would much rather see Kamala first before Reed Richards. Uh, and we almost did. <laughs> so it's like, oh, we've seen Reed Richards, Mr. Stretch. We technically did. Huh? We technically did. Yes, we technically did. In term, by no, no, no. We saw, I'm sorry, we saw Reed Richards before Kamala. Technically. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We saw Reed first, yeah. technically, by a month, and then he died. Um, so I'm just right. like, just give her, just give her, the, just give her the stretchy powers because she can also shape shift, which Sue can do technically, as of a couple years back. No one talks about that shit. You know, no, no one's gonna be look at Sue Storm and be like, hey, she's copying Mystique. They're like, who gives a shit, bro? And, oh, you got two people that stretch. And it's like, okay, her powers come from herself in various future timelines. His powers come from the fact of just like stable molecules and Marvel bullshit. It's like make make her use her powers in ways that Reed don't doesn't. That's how you, you know what I also it. think what I also think could be is the fact that we already got um we already got <laughs> the the She Hulk trailer, right? Mm -hmm. And people been shit on that trailer. Even the show itself I feel like looks oh, good. shit. We didn't talk about that. Yeah, yeah. She Hulk trailer dropped. Yeah, you can bring that up too. Um, it looks. It looks <laughs> good. So the effects good. do not. That's all I'll say. It looks funny. It effects looks don't look good. Oh, the and effects I look think bad. part of the reason why they changed it. It's just speculation here. I think one of them was was the Reed Richards thing because they didn't want two characters to have a power so close together, especially if they bring it towards like a a modern audience sort of thing. And I think that the other thing is, I feel like we've made great advances in the technology you know we have things like avatar and like the blue people in there and we have things like thanos but i still think and multiverse of Mad madness even proved this it's still hard to make stretchy things look good in movie and especially in television mm -hmm. and i think that it's easier to buy that she has this 
this sort of uh, cosmic uh, power. Cosmic crystals. It is a physical, her hands and, and limbs getting big. I think it's a, weirdly enough, it's like a, it's an easier leap for I feel larger audience to make than a girl who expands her body and, and, and biggins. That being said, I want to put money down at least $5 that at some point in the future with them exploring the multiverse, we will get a comic accurate Kamala that does stretch that way. But I feel like as for the main MCU, they wanted it to be more tied to a cosmic sort of a background. But that being said, it might not even be cosmic for all we know, because I don't know if you notice this, as we were watching the episode, every time she would activate and use the the bands, I think it would play Pakistani music or like some sort of mystical Middle Eastern music to go along yeah. with it. It kind of has that sort of aesthetic to the bracelet itself. So I think that maybe they wanted it to tie more directly to her heritage and a cosmic background to kind of fuse those two things to make it more authentic to those two sides of her, to make that more aspect more literal about the character as opposed to the self-acceptance or using those two aspects to further explore the self-acceptance thing or making it more of a a choice of self-acceptance or which side she can accept or both sides or if she can come to come to uh, terms with those things in a different avenue than making her power something of of uh, elasticity so i don't know only time is going to tell what what we're going to get from this show so far i really enjoy it i like kamala and i think that to, if I'm being honest, just based off of this first episode, I feel like they've done like the high school kid in high school thing better already than Homecoming did. Because I oh. feel like it wanted to be, yeah. it wanted to be. So, I, I think Homecoming and was in, or high school was the inspiration, or John Hughes was the inspiration as the yeah. basis for where the story took place. But I felt like this is actual like a high school story with a girl that's actively in high school. And I felt like we didn't, and granted we did see Peter Parker in high school. We didn't see him like talk to the school counselor or anything. Yeah, he like, barely, you know, right, go he's ahead. more focused on the heroic stuff. But then again, it's only been an episode. So I yeah, can't but, really say. No, I, I, I do agree with you because we get a lot. I mean, let's be real. Peter Parker had significantly less friends. So his social yeah. interactions literally had to be written. Into, Ned had to be a, whole ass creation who's a fusion low key it didn't hit me until this i'm like oh he's half uh genki but also like half bruno low key yeah like, totally when i'm watching bruno in the show who bruno in the show is aside from his hair that is one thing that was weird to me they really shortened his hair here um and you know i'm a stickler for hair but like I'm like, oh yeah, Bruno is like Kamala's basic man in the chair. Like in the comics recently, he uh, or a couple arcs ago, he got back from Wakanda after he like broke his arm, so he has a semi bionic arm. But he's like known to be Kamala's like bestie, and I'm like, oh fuck! Now people are gonna be like, hey, he's too much like Ned Leeds. It's like, oh, no. oh, no, he's not. <laughs> Ned Leeds took from Bruno in in uh, quite a few ways, and I'm just I'm like. Damn, so it's like, yeah, they had to make friends for Peter to have, because in the comics, he doesn't really have too many people he's cool with till, like, college. Um, I think you went back and read the high school stuff, but, like, Kamala, she has a circle. Like, she has her brother and, uh, I think her name is Nadia, the one with the uh, hijab, and she has Bruno, and, like, um, Zoe eventually comes around to be part of that circle, too. Like, she has, like, four or five consistent friends throughout no. the, the lion's really? share of her run after she gets through her uh, initial arc. But like at the minimum, she starts off with like three people and a very like prominent family life and uh community with her relationship of being like a uh, Muslim and, and Pakistani and everything. So oh, that was a nice touch too. them speaking Urdu um, and Arabic. I thought was nice too. Yeah. So let me, let me ask you this. As someone who was, a, is a massive Kamala fan and who's read, her stuff. Do you feel like this pilot re- spiritually represented that book accurately? Spiritually, yes. It it deviates quite a fair share from uh Tony. Yeah, like to- like it deviates a fair amount from if we're talking like literal adaptation, but in terms of capturing the spirit of like that first issue, 
I think it does a really good job. Like I, because when I'm sitting watching it, I wasn't sitting there thinking about, oh, this is so different from her original appearance. I'm like, no, because it got the spirit of who she was. Like she's a nerd. She loves Carol, even though I don't like Carol. I like Kamala significantly more, and that is true from the from the books to the movies. So they they nailed it. Um, so it's like, yeah, they they got the fact that Bruno. Um, you can see like it a tiny bit in the first episode. It's like Bruno is like the friend who might want to be more, but they're still close, and he listens to her crazy ideas. And she's like, they she made her they made her a little bit more kind of ADHD in this, but not in a way that bothered me. I think it just kind of leans more into her trying to express herself as a way of trying to f- figure herself out. So it didn't, it didn't bother me. So like when I was thinking about, it, I'm like to somebody who hasn't read this, I think it works fantastically, but to someone that has read it, I still think it's very, very strong. Like my only minor gripe is with the powers thing, but you can still do that thematic narrative with the way they change the powers. I just want to make sure they, they do do that. I have five more episodes for them to prove that to me. That's the thing. I have a feeling that the bracelet's going to be stuck on her arm and she can't take it off. I think that's kind of the route I feel like they might take. They might go with it. What I'm kind of hoping long term is that, um, because I mean, like they changed Monica's uh, powers and how she gets them, like significantly so from her book, her book too. And it, it didn't, I mean, granted, she's a lot lesser known, even though she's the fucking top tier. Uh, fucking here, like her and Carol have been on the same team. They're both like fucking nut- nightmares. Um, but it's like it didn't really bother me that she got her powers from like low key the Scarlet Witch, you know. And um, so for this one, it's like I can. It's more so what the powers end up representing, and the fact that they change the powers themselves. So as long as they get, like you pointed out, as long as they properly adapt the theme which I think they're on the path to doing and I'll adjust to it. You know, I I think I'm also like, I think I do kind of want her to stand out a little bit. I think they want a little bit of uh, similarities with the Marvels of them having like cosmic quantum ish type of powers. So like the scheme kind of fits in. Cause like, even if you think about it, you know, Carol has flaming energy powers, uh, Monica basically has various forms of, of wavelength manipulation, you know, energy and spectrum manipulation. And then Kamala is the stretchy one. So I think they're trying to kind of incorporate it. Be like, how do we make her more like the others? Cause that doesn't connect whatsoever. ever. Um, also there was, a, there was a cool nod in here too, to uh, Carol's old costume. Um, yeah. I noticed that. I was, I was like, like that's really, I'm like, that's funny. It's like, that's not even like the comic book. She, she would never wear that. And I'm like, I wish. <laughs> yeah, like the costume style was like her old suit, but the design yeah. itself was like the new suit. Which, funny enough, that is a suit that Carol has kind of worn because she's had that swimsuit bodysuit thing with the star in it, with her legs exposed. But it's not the it's not the lightning bolt one. She has another one that's red that does look kind of like that one. So it's kind of a reference to to both. Um, yeah, the, the funniest thing about Kamala's superhero suit is that it is a literal adaptation of uh, Miss Marvel's costume in terms of them both being bathing suits. Like, that was the joke, it, you know, Carol's old one piece. It's like, oh my god, she has something but a bathing suit on. And then Kamala's suit is literally a, uh, I think, a Pakistani bathing suit, which covers the full body <laughs> down to the knee. <laughs> So, huh. and it took me a long time to get, I'm like, oh, fuck. I read this on the page years ago and it just hit that that was like a joke. I'm like, God damn it. Um, I still have minor gripes with like her costume design. It's a little over-designed. Like the co- she has a, uh, oh, there was something also that I wanted to talk about. Um, how do you feel about the, the parents? Because I actually, no double toasted, Corey doesn't really like them. I really like them, maybe because I work with kids and parents in in my own job. Um, so I see like the. Oh, I, like them. I, didn't know that. I like them. I like. I them. think that. Yeah, they they feel they feel like real parents to me. You know, like granted, I yeah. feel like the fact that 
her they really wanted the the fact that her mom is the fastest seamstress in the world. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, making them both costumes that quick. I'm like, she ham. That was Damn, huh? That was probably one of my favorite parts of the episode. It's like, oh yeah, that's another thing. This episode actually took me back to uh to my middle and high school experiences because I was I was a couple years younger than Kamala um when I went to my first convention. I was like in my first cosplay and everything and it was homemade. It was not good. <laughs> like I mean it was simple, but it was like it wasn't bad. It was just eh, you know, easy to understand. But um like I understood a lot of Kamala's experiences you know, being a nerd, being in fandom, going to cons, things like that, but also wanting to kind of separate yourself from your parents. And I also could relate to how she felt about her family, not really understanding, uh, you know, her interest in, in different things or why they're there. But what struck me was like how enthusiastic her dad was to like be Hulk. And I really, you know, I know she groaned at it in the episode, but what, her mom did was really really cool because she did a, a cultural adaptation of a superhero and i thought that's yeah. a, like as a cosplayer i'm like that's really awesome you know not like you you see those um from time to time like um i saw a guy that did a mashup of of a, a prince and dr strange and i how do you call it it's like the like the purple sorcerer supreme or something like that um, or sorcerer prince or something. It was like it was a really dope idea. So like when you go to cons, you see really cool shit like that. And I felt bad for her dad because I'm like, one, that's a really cool idea. But two, like her want, wanting to be like independent teenager kids, like I don't want my parents involved in my nerdy shit. I just want to live my life. You know, it, she she rejected it. Um, cause it's just like, well, actually dad, there's no little Hulk. There's just the Hulk. And I'm like, Oh, fuck, kid. oh, if you only knew it's like how rare it is to get a parent that like gives a shit about the, the shit that you like, like, you know, my, my oldest nephew and, uh, and his dad bond over the Marvel shit all the time. You know, I walked past a call and my sister was like, Oh, thank God. Um, you know, he he told me to watch WandaVision before I saw Multiverse of Madness. And and I'm over like, I have to tell my mom to watch certain shit to be like, before you watch this, watch this, this, and this, so you don't get confused. But no, I thought I yeah, I really like the parents. Um I yeah, think uh, they have a lot of I range like, to them as characters, and I like that. Yeah, I like the fact that her mom kind of had that talk with her at the end of the episode and then you know the, the fact that she was um she she wasn't appreciative of, of what her parents did for her it felt very authentic to a teenager and the fact that rather than her parents getting all mad they were like disappointed and crushed by the by her reaction i was like oh the name of heart hurt mm-hmm. so yeah I, I like that her parents are so included because like i feel like this is so refreshing especially for the mcu for somebody that has parents, parents, that parents being so involved in in the protagonist story because either they're dead or they're not mentioned or out of the picture or whatever but her parents and her family are very front and center in this which i think that going forward if this show is good all the way through she could be like the heart of the mcu because she has that i don't know just something about the the actress and how the character is written and just seeing the progression of that i mean and just and also her being a fangirl looking forward to seeing what her interacting with the other heroes is like, like, is she still a fangirl in that, in that, uh, that area? And like, does she, what is her owning up to being a hero? How she look like, you know, her fully embracing the fact that she's a hero. And when she herself becomes an Avenger, mm-hmm. cause like, man, before she had her powers, as we we're just watching, I'm like, I can just watch this, this high school show. It's this girl who's a fan of the Avengers, even yeah. though, even though, really I, well done. <laughs> Notice something that did throw me out, which is like a very nitpicky kind of thing. When there, when she was at Avengers Con and they were showing the different things, it took me out for a second that it, it flashed to one. It, sh- it showed the Guardians there at the Avengers convention. I'm like, I saw that somebody was dressed as Drax. Yeah, I was like, what? I'm like, All right, I mean, on Earth, like, okay. Yes. But also, they showed 
it was like a, a two second thing, but it showed a uh, like f- figures of Ant Man. It all yes. the bo- they're still walking to said Marvel's Ant Man and the Wasp. Like yes, promoter- yes, it was. I movie. saw that too. <laughs> like that's weird. I don't like that. Don't do that. That's one of those weird meta things, like how in Shazam when he ran through the toy store and he threw the Batman doll at Doctor Savannah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just like it's one of those weird things. It's like. I'm not going to think about this any harder than I have to. I'm just going to let that be because if I do, I'm going to hurt my brain. <laughs> right. <laughs> Your brain will go really yeah, meta. I can and I'm not going to think about this. In, in the DC universe. I can believe that. I mean, eh, maybe he was, he's kind of like a. This is, well, that was post Justice League. So maybe yeah. he's not like a, 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 a myth at that point. Yeah, he's a, he's but the fact that it was Marvel's Ant Man and the Wasp, I'm like, whoa, what the fuck is that? Is Marvel a company in the in the MCU now? Don't, like, what the fuck don't that do that, that, that to yourself. It's, it's gonna, gonna hurt. I'm not gonna think about it. I'm, I'm not about gonna it. go. It's gonna there. hurt. <laughs> I, I, I saw that address it. it, and then I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna let it into the ether. But, but yeah, that was my only slight nitpick with the episode. I, other than that, I thought it was great, and I look forward to seeing where the show goes. Yeah, it it might have my uh, my favorite. Of the premieres, probably followed by Moon Knight and uh, WandaVision. 100%. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, those are the, the top three to be right now. Um, I just hope it's six landing because that's the sixth episode. I hope it doesn't avoid the sixth episode curse. I hope it, I hope it beats the curse, man. Because, and, and I think you're right. I think they are trying to, because their licensing with Spider-Man is so in flux right now. I think they're trying to pivot because Kamala is about as close as they'll get to a modern Peter Parker, like unironically, even before, because they can't do Miles. So it's just like, right. this is the one that they have. And that's what, because when I'm watching the episode, I'm like, they put a lot of fucking money into this. Um, if you're, because you're seeing all of her thoughts as the animation in the background and everything is moving. It looks like Mitchell's versus the machines damn near. Like when they were walking in the background was moving. I'm like, yeah, I think trying to pivot for phase four and be like this is going to be our peter because we don't we thought we could like easel him out and maybe buy you know buy out sony in a contract and they won't budge so let's just let's keep her let's push her up there and keep her around because i don't think we're gonna have spider-man as like i think the the linchpin was supposed to be uh after endgame i think it was supposed to be Either Spider-Man or Black Panther. Both of those got fucked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they just had to go like, shit. Uh, okay, this one is a pretty good bet. Uh, so yeah. Um, I'm going to do some, some quick talk about Moon Knight. Yeah, because we didn't get to talk about it last week. We spent three hours, or last time, we spent yes. three hours talking about Doctor Strange. Yeah. Um. You want to start off? I don't with even start, with start off with Miss Marvel. You can start off Moon Knight. How, how how did you feel about the show? You know, when it first started, I was really enthralled by it. I think from start to from for the most part, start to finish, I was really captivated by by the show because just because Oscar Isaac really sold the show, and and I think a lot of people felt the same way. The fact that he was able to just flex his acting muscles and play both. An American, not an American, not only that's not himself or like not his traditional accent, because he in interviews he said he did a Chicago kind of accent for for Mark, but also this complete total commitment to this guy named um Steven, Stephen Grant. And you believe that he was a Brit and you believe that he was this guy and, and, and he was like the linchpin for you to root on to become attached to. Uh, and there's been so many different iterations of Moon Knight, and I've I've never been like a huge Moon Knight fan, but I knew who he was like from playing games like Spider Man Web of Shadows and just watching various Marvel shows and whatnot because I was I was familiar with him, but I didn't know him like super well. And I think the the show did a good job of balancing um, being this show about a, a adventure and, and, and Egyptian mythology while also addressing dissociative identity disorder in a way that didn't make it scary or didn't didn't try to like make it seem like a, a victim sort of thing. Like it, it it was 
the the incident of what happened and how it came that way was very traumatic and sad but the way that they displayed the disorder itself was not that way and i'm happy they they didn't do that uh, but I, I will say as much as i did enjoy the most of the episodes i think the only oh. ones i didn't love was probably episode three and episode which one was which one was Six, three? I think was also kind of a little underwhelming for me, but I think that's only because of it didn't manage to escape the six episode curse. Because I don't know, I think it's something about these Marvel shows, they they design them to be a show that you watch week to week. They they aren't designed and and considered for the binging model. So because they they want to build this hype for week to week. When you finally do watch it back to back, it feels a little odd in certain places. Like, for example, the first thing that comes to my mind is the fact that at the end of episode five of this amazing journey of you discovering the history of Mark and Steve and how they came to be, and then them bonding in and being able to pass into the field of Reeves or letting our, our Stephen sacrificing himself so Stephen can go into the field of Reeves. Uh, it ends on that sad cliff note of Stephen being frozen in the sea, and then literally 15 minutes later in the next episode, he just it's just undone. So all the tension of that is ruined because that was supposed to be a cliffhanger to only last a week. But say we had maybe like a 8 to 12 episode season, you could have really felt that or like see what that looks like for Mark. You know, so like it it goes deep in certain areas, but not deep enough in other areas. And weirdly enough, I think the show was very captivating for me as an audience member, but I know that certain other audience members weren't too pleased with the fact that this was more focused on the characters of Steven and Mark and then the mythology of where they came from more so than the super heroics and, and what Moon Knight actually does. Like we're so focused on the mythology of of Conchu and and these other Egyptian gods, and Conchu's whole thing with Mark is the fact that he is the he is his agent of vengeance. We don't really see that at all in the show, so I can understand people's frustrations with that. And I feel like whatever they're going to do in season two sort of sets up for, I guess, a more traditional version of that in a weird way. I think it's a roundabout way, but we're exposing more personalities of this character. And I think that hopefully we'll we'll uh, see some of that. I think it's it's also interesting that I the dynamic between Kanchu and these these two heroes of Steven and Mark, because Kanchu isn't great. He's not like a great guy. He oh, he's a piece of shit. Shitty. So it's interesting to see a premise for a hero that is contingent on a shitty deal. And I wonder how long that's sustainable. Because I feel like in a comic book, you can do that forever. But as a show, if you're doing that as an isolated show, that feels like something that has to come to a head. So I'm interesting how they walk that line. So ultimately, I had a great time with Moon Knight. And I think that seeing where that character goes on its individual journey is going to be a fascinating one, but also how it ties in to the other stuff to be interesting, but I hope it, it ties in in a sort of loose way, kind of how the guardians tied into the events of infinity war. So like, they're not super integral to what's going on, but they can play because something within their world has called them to a larger scenario, but they have an easy exit once that scenario is over like i don't need to see moon knight as part of the avengers but i wouldn't Ooh. mind seeing him interact with the avengers i i don't think he should be part of the avengers i i think he, his ass needs to stay on the midnight suns he can interact with the avengers i feel like they can offer it to him and i feel like he'd be like fuck no i feel like if, if marvel <laughs> was to ever have an f-bomb in all of their movies that would be the one prime perfect spot it's like mark is like mark we we've understood and recognized the work you've done to like maintain the balance of the world in the universe do you want to be part of the avengers and it's just like fuck no and then just credits like <laughs> the, 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 the one they should use um yeah so so quick thoughts and then we can probably get out of here um yeah i i agree with a fair amount of what you said um with this being marvel's kind of first deep dive into i guess you know 
a bit more of a complex character. Um, Godzilla Mendoza's video, I think, has a lot of really interesting critiques as somebody who's a a deeper fan of the character. So, uh, you know, as a parallel to me and Miss Marvel, he has himself and Godzilla Mendoza and Moon Knight. But um, overall, I quite enjoyed the show. It's relative, not relatively, it's just about self-contained. Um, the only thing I can think of that might be a reference is like Ost is like I think shown in that hall of the of the other trapped gods, so that might tie into Panther too. But um, no, um, Oscar Isaac's acting fantastic. Uh, I think most of the fight choreography is pretty good. Um, I think it hinges just a smidge too much on it being an action show than it being like a psychological exploration like it should have been. Uh, as it went on, I think there was a better balance of the Steve and Mark dynamic, but them introducing Jake Loxley in, what, a post credit scene? I don't think was a good way to handle that shit at all. Uh, like, you could have easily cut some of the stuff in some of those other episodes and dedicated that more to Jake and what Jake represents so that... And he does like I get it. It was kind of supposed to be a surprise, but it's like when he tells him at the end, you know. I think that leaves the audience knowing that it's like, well, Jake's the one who didn't break the deal with Conchu, and it was implied all throughout the show that Jake was was present. But then for us to not get a reveal until literally like the last scene, eh? eh. But I I liked Layla uh, as a complicated love interest. You know, I think we had a whole conversation once. It's like, is it? No, no, it was a conversation I listened to. They're saying, is it cheating if you have a relationship with somebody's alter? I'm like, fuck, it's a great question. Um, I like the suit. At moments, the CGI can be a little iffy. Um, I, I thought Steven was fine. I, I like Mark significantly more. Um, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I did like Mark more. Just because, like, I mean, Steven, Steven is a brainy one. Mark is the more logical side. I, I found Mark to be a little bit more likable. Maybe because I don't really care to see Oscar Isaac play. He plays him well, but I don't care to see like a weak, demure, helpless character. I think, you know, I think that could have been a better part. Better. I don't know. I feel like Steven wasn't that, wasn't that guy by the end of the season. And I kind of bought that transformation. I think they could have done a, a little bit more to bring it more to the forefront. I think it, I think it was there by the, I think what really aided it was um, probably one of my favorite, the favorite two episodes I had was a one, I think it was three and four. Three is the one where he gets shot, right? Or is it four? Four is the one where he gets shot. Yeah. So four and five, I think are my favorites Four because it, that's where it does the mind bend reveal. And I really, really like that, that twist um, where you kind of start to put the pieces together. Just like, okay, what is and isn't reality. And then five, just for like that whole exploration and deep dive into, you know, his backstory, his trauma, the death of his brother, blah, blah, blah. And like his, uh, his abuse at the hands of his mother. Um, you know, so I, I really liked that episode and it gave a lot of time to give a lot of range and freedom to Oscar Isaac and, and his exploration. And, and um, I think the only thing through the, through the majority of, also, I really like Kanchu, uh, the pantheon of the gods, their avatars could have definitely been a lot more diverse for some Egyptian gods. That part's a little odd, but whatever. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be that guy, but you know, it is an interesting observation. Um, what was, what was the hippo goddess's name? He was adorable. Um, I don't know. I know you're talking about that. She's cute. That was fun. Yeah, I would even hold you. The, the goddesses in the show, they're a little, you know, it, I don't know, man. I was I was waiting for uh, uh, Ama to to the, the crocodile one villain uh, to kind of come out, have that Meg the Stallion body. I was waiting for it. You know, I'm just like, okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah, we're trying to, she was, I would even hold you. She was a little bad for, you know, a, a crocodile lady has some hip to her. Um, I, oh no, that was the one I said. I um on the CBC page, I said if Bass uh doesn't have the body of Meg the Stallion, we riot. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> in, in Black Panther two, just get give give her that body. Give her that body, yaddy. I'm here to see it. I'll I don't give a shit. I'll Photoshop it. Put a cat head on. <laughs> yeah, your body, yaddy. Yeah, 
quick. But no, the only thing that kind of rubbed me the wrong way was that whole sequence where um I already know what you're gonna say. Yeah. Yeah, where Mark Mark and you're Steven right, reunited you. in uh not the field of reeds, but that that desert. He's like, I don't need it. He's like, I don't need a suit. You're my superpower. And I'm like, drama coping? <laughs> like, I'm, it that felt weird to me. Because like I'm not going to make a one-to-one comparison, but it's like because DID, especially in this literal context, is usually the result of some sort of like protective trauma response in terms of creating that altar. Um, It's like, oh, this uncontrollable innate way in which I deal with the fact that I was physically and mentally abused by my mother. uh, That's my superpower. A uncontrollable coping skill. I'm like, that's feels weird like i get what the intention was or it's just like hey you know you being there to make me emotionally vulnerable and wiser is is a superpower in itself but steven is literally a coping mechanism <laughs> taken right you no know, psychological form so it's a weird it's like saying it's like holding up a bottle of uh well butrin and it's like you're my superpower <laughs> medication <laughs> but he's a whole other person so it's like uh, i understood i thought it was sweet i thought it was sweet. i get the entire I, I have a bias just because because you know me and you know what i do for work so when i heard that i'm right. like ah! <laughs> hey, let's not glorify this but yeah, I get you. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think they were trying. To, I don't think they were trying to glorify. It. I think overall the moment landed. I, it was like, eh, now we'll we'll let it go. We'll let it go. I'm not gonna think too hard about it. I'm not gonna think too hard about it. You know, I'm just gonna let that moment. This is your Ant Man. This is your Ant Man toy moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm just like I'm gonna let it be sweet. I'm gonna let it be nice. I'm not gonna put any more on it. Um. Yeah. Overall, I I think it's pretty good. Uh, I agree. It needed it needed eight episodes. Um. Uh, Marvel, stop this six episode mandate. It is holding you back, but don't go for 13. Eight to 10 is the sweet spot. Works for the Eight to it works for the boys. You know, they got it down pat. They're they're doing well with it. Um, it's about to work out pretty well for Stranger Things, and they got what nine episodes total. Is where we're gonna end up this season. So yeah, so yeah, so I think it's going to be, um, and that show's great, you know, I'm not going to probably maybe review that once uh, that's done, but yeah. Uh, oh, quick thing before we go. How do you feel about Euphoria season two? It's like one, one sentence thought. It was all over the place. I thought some characters got dirt, none dirty. Other characters like Rue got done really well. Episode five, I think, or the one where she's on the run is probably one of the best episodes of television I've ever seen. And yeah, even though it's a show, Zendaya deserves an Oscar. That's all I'll say about that. Yeah, I I agree for the most part. Um, favorite episodes were the play, and uh, and the Runaway episode. Um, yeah, a good show in terms of entertainment. Messy as fuck. It, but it, at production, great acting, great production. Writing is messy as shit. But uh. uh <laughs> The scene with Nate's dad is one of the funniest bits of television I've seen in years. <laughs> Please put your pants oh, yeah, back on. Pretty- I am who I am. <laughs> 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 All right, dog. Uh, let's get out of here. Maybe next time we can kind of dig into some other things that we have to talk about in a while because we still haven't gotten around to the fucking Batman. We didn't talk about the Thor trailer. Oh. Um, fuck it. At this point, we'll probably just do the movie review once that drops. Um, it looks good. Yeah. But, um, yeah, uh, anything to say? Do you peace out to the people? Because I know you yeah. gotta go. I think we made this is our shortest podcast. I think we talked about all the things we did, and um, good, I think we did it well. I think we podcast well today. Yeah, yeah, we were we were efficient more than usual because we had to be, but I, I think we, uh, we made it work. Um, so so maybe next time if we have a little bit more time, we can talk about like. Batman and everything everywhere all at once and some other shit. Um, so do you, do you have anything that you want to advertise? Uh, nothing to plug today. No. Okay. no. Um, did, did you have any reels reacts at all? Uh, coming up. 
Okay. Umbrella Academy season three coming soon. Okay. Okay. So that's that's a plug. Check out our friend over at Real Rejects. Anyways, I've been your host, Will the Greatest. Um, this is our boy the real Aaron Alexander. Uh, don't forget to like the show, comment the show, follow the show, share the show with your friends, hit notifications so you can know when we drop new episodes. Um Check me out on all my socials, all Will the Greatest, uh, just about everywhere. And we will see you in the next episode. Uh, be great to one another. Be, be excellent to one another. <laughs> <laughs> Watch Bill and Ted 3 today. It's a good time. Bye, yes. <laughs> all right, you guys. Deuces. <laughs>